kind of shuffling a little tight to each other. It might be human, old human tracks. Let's go take a look and see anyway. You never know. There's moose, moose tracks in the sand here, that's for sure. There's some snowmobile tracks here too, so that tells me it could be human related. Oh, that's definitely melted right out, isn't it? Huh, that's big. Look at that. I don't know what that is. Well, it's moose right there in, in these tracks. <clears throat> moose droppings. Well, I guess they're moose. The moose got me again. Huh. All right. Well, onward and upward northward. You don't know unless you look, right? Just kind of hoping they're gonna be monster grizzly tracks. I'll guarantee you we're gonna see some grizzlies shortly. Hopefully not too close as I'm doing my thing. Here we go, I'm back at it. Well, I would I stopped that lake, but there's somebody camping there. There's traffic going along, kind of noisy. It is uh, dead quiet here. As in dead, 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 dead quiet. <laughs> Last fall, I don't know if you guys remember, I was hunting by myself and I made a bunch of videos from where I was. And uh, I was way out there. See my finger? I was all, I was all out in that country out there. And I went as far as you can see on my quad. I forget how many hundreds of miles I put on last year out in that country by myself. I love that. I don't know why. I just do. I just love it. I love going where I haven't been before. I love just getting right out there alone and snooping around and hunting. I'm sure lots of you think I'm crazy. Well, I talk about Sasquatch on YouTube. Of course I'm crazy. <laughs> lots of my friends think I'm a little nuts for doing this by myself, but whatever. is dead dead quiet here and what can i share you about this country right here um <clears throat> we had a fellow email us me um maybe a year ago maybe even two years ago now and he has some hunting property which isn't too far away it's like through you can see me off to the right all this timber on the timber line on the right hand side just over that hump down the bottom so basically that, that patch right there. And he has some ongoing weird things going on in that property. He wanted to give me his name, that's fine. And um, I think he said he had a, he made a spring. He was diverting some water with a line to come down and feed his cabin. And he went back up there in this big box that he had put there, something moved it and took it apart and uh, left him a wall of broken spruce trees. I think he said it was like eight feet tall or something. I, I might have screwed up that number, I'm not sure, it was a while back, but I remember he said it was a significant wall had been built across his quad trail. And uh, he felt a little nervous there. <clears throat> then he went back again, I think the next day, or he fixed his water up and he went back and, and the trees were all gone. Weird, right? And he is the only person who has access to that land then another friend of mine used to be a wrangler years ago. Came on as a wrangler, young guy. He's got a family in, in the next town here. And he, he emailed me to tell me that a friend of his is a trap line right over here. And he was finding uh, large barefoot footprints in the snow here. Winter before, yeah, so last winter, not this last winter, but the winter before. And that was just right over here. So there you go. It's kind of funny, isn't it? Every single place I go in this province, somebody has emailed me something about what's going on there, right? It is what it is. It's real, factual, it's happening. 
and there's nothing anybody can do to make it stop or go away, right? But anyway, it's an appropriate little place to get something heard. Hope I don't get screamed at while I'm doing this. It's dead quiet here, man. It is dead, dead quiet here. Just have a listen for a second. Not even a bird, nothing. There's some game tracks here, but there's like three different sets of deer tracks running this way in the mud right here. And there's a set of moose tracks running down that way. That's about it. <laughs> anyway, let's get, let's get another voice heard while I'm here. And it is quiet here. All right, there's no subject in this one. Hi Steve, my name is Gray. Feel free to use my name. I'm an Albertan, Albertan, born and raised. I love the outdoors. I do a lot of, oh, I think I forgot this one, didn't I? Yeah, we just read that one, right? Yeah, all right. Let's get the next one. I saw something. <clears throat> I live in North Central North Carolina, and I know every creature that lives around me, I thought. I wanted to walk my little house dog around 1 a.m. for a few weeks ago. She started acting up, growling, and ran behind my truck in a dark spot in the yard. We got two security lights, street lights, one in front and one in the back. And it was a very rural area we live in. Only two houses on our deadened gravel road, surrounded by all, surrounded by all forest on three sides and a large cattle pasture out front. Anyway, I made the quiet sound of my dog and she zipped it up and came straight to me. I was fussing to hear her a little and told her, you know, if a skunk sprays you, you'll be spending the night outside, don't you? Then she growled again, looking behind my truck, again, the only dark place in the front yard. Some kind of creature I've never seen walked right out into the dimly lit edge of my driveway and up a little incline into the yard. It was on all fours and had huge hindquarters and barely any front legs at all, more like little arms. Then it quartered towards us and raised up on its hind legs, looking right at us. I'll be 100% honest, I thought kangaroo. Wait a minute, no tail, no long neck. It had a very thick fur with long, coarse-looking hair sticking out a little farther from its body. It walked maybe three or four steps on its hind legs, then down on those short fronts as well and walked very slowly across the yard towards the woods. I scooped my dog up, tossed her into the front door and yelled loudly for my son inside to come and look at this weird as hell critter outside. Then I ran across the yard to watch it a little more. This whole time I was armed. I always put my little nine shot 22 in my PJs or boxers, whatever I have on, I'm armed. It was at least 40 yards across the yard and turned, okay, sorry, it was at least 40 yards across the yard and turned and went under my neighbor's camper. My son had come out and he was armed as well with his rifle. We had a coyote incident a month prior to this night, so we thought it was another pack of yotes. We went under the metal roof of the camper parking garage and suddenly realized it's so dark we couldn't see anything. And now, 50 or 60 yards from the house, where I kept a spotlight on the porch just for this type of critters at night thing, he kept asking, what is it? Do I need to run and grab the light? I told him, it's a thing I've never seen in my entire life, not on this continent. And he asked, Dad, what in the hell are you talking about? Are you okay? Don't you have your pistol on you? I never thought to take it from my pocket. This thing had never once shown aggression or came at me. I then told him, don't shoot at anything unless you know it's going to attack or seems to be aggressive. It's got to be someone's pet of a sort. I'm ignorant of its type. It rose up on two legs and had crazy hair and a weird face, just something I've never seen, I guess. He said, Dad, I'm wondering if you've just gone crazy or seen a dog or cat maybe, maybe a big raccoon, and you just thought it was weird. Man, come on, let's go inside. It's dark out here, and you just couldn't see it, plain as all. I had to tell him I saw it for almost a full minute in the full security lights, and I know what I saw. 
just not what it was. It wasn't quite as big as a shepherd dog, but bigger than a coyote by at least 10 or 15 pounds. It had a sort of a nose, but not a long canine muzzle or a snout sticking out far. No sign of long ears. It had a, it had a tail, but it was short or even curved up on his back a little. Very small in its front shoulder area, more like a creature that spends its time on two legs. I looked over the internet for such animals for hours the next morning and we went looking for sign. Both my sons and I have fished and hunted all over our area and even other places. Love the outdoors and pride ourselves in knowing all the different types of wildlife quite well around here. We found tracks right where I said it would definitely be some because I watched it walk across a washed out spot between the two yards up front. That convinced my oldest boy that, I'd, that I knew I'd seen something odd and was concerned about it. The tracks were extremely cat-like in appearance, but larger than a house cat or bobcat. We all know tracks very well. My grandfather taught me to track all things, and before I ever saw the inside of a schoolhouse. I wish I could draw or find this type of animal, just for my own self, if not for any other reason. If you hunt and spend a lot of time in the deep woods as I do, you know what I mean by that. Closest things I've seen that is similar to what I saw is a porcupine, not from here, and it was way bigger than that, and a few monkeys. Hope my description is enough for someone to help. It'd be a peace of mind thing for me anyway. I don't care if you use my name with this. I'm 53, and I still hunt with iron sights because my eyesight is good enough. I'm not crazy. Anyone who knows me knows it. The Hedge. All right. Well, there you go. I shared it. Um, obviously, I didn't read this before he mailed in, and uh, we have had a similar description with a guy with his daughters in Texas, but he had, I think he had flip-flops or running shoes on, and he couldn't quite run after it, and it went across the road in front of the truck, and the headlights sounded like the same as what you've seen. So maybe somebody else from your area is watching, and they've seen it, and if you have, comment below in the comment section below the video, all right? That sounds pretty freaking weird, man. Anyway, what else do we got? Hi, Steve. My name is James Hebert. Pronounced A Bear. What? All right, it's spelled H E B E R T and it's pronounced A Bear. All right. I was born and raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I currently live. Over the past few years, I've come to conclude that I may very well be a member of the club of no return, also. Albeit, though, my induction into it was not by a traumatic encounter, but rather by what I now perceive to have been two intentionally instigated events which occurred during my childhood. To the best of my memory, they both took place during the summer of 66 or 67. As to which event occurred first, I cannot honestly say, but it has been through my often reflecting on them throughout the years and now coupled with the priceless information and hindsight provided through your channel, I reiterate that this is an intentional work slash effort that has been unfolding to bring all things to light, not only through human beings such as ourselves, but also by the Sabe people themselves. Event number one. Both events took place at the home where I grew up being the last of 10 siblings, seven girls and three boys. It was located on the west bank of the Rio Grande River in the section of Albuquerque known as the South Valley, which is actually just a rural area, Bernalillo, pronounced Bernalillo, county at the time. Now when I say that it was on the west bank of the river, that means that when you cross the fence in the rear of a property, you would immediately be in what is called the bosque, which is comprised primarily of primarily of huge cottonwood trees, which extend 50 yards at best to the river itself. One mid-afternoon, myself and my sister, closest to me in age, Jennifer, were in our backyard doing, hell, I don't have a clue, lol, we were little kids, but it's what we heard that seared the day, at least in my mind. I haven't spoken to her about since I haven't spoken to her about since that day, but I know for sure that she heard it on that day. We heard what we heard was the voice of what we both thought was a man, a big man at that, and all the voice said was, uh, mmm, as to get your attention. Not only did I hear it, I felt it. We looked all around in every direction, not a single soul in sight. I was so amazed by it that I went straight inside the house to where my mom was in the kitchen and told her what happened. She listened to me and believed me, and she told me that she didn't know who or what it was either, but that God sends his angels around us. 
Event number two, I was sitting in a chair in our living room watching television with at least six or seven of my siblings. It was already dark outside. Now the chair I was sitting in was right next to a window that viewed directly into the patio on the north side of the house. As I was sitting there, something prompted me to turn and look out into the patio, but it wasn't by any movement. The window itself was old style windows you see in adobe houses, having two sides with four glass panes each that you can completely remove. Well, it was one of those awesome summer nights of the 60s in New Mexico, so the windows had been removed, leaving only the screen in place. To my total surprise, as I looked out onto the patio, there was a totally black figure of a person, not even 10 feet away from me, just standing there, strangely, so as if they were waiting for me to see them, but positioned so that none of my siblings could see them. I couldn't make out any clothing outlines, skin color, or anything. Just a human figure, all black, no more than five feet tall. I looked directly at it, at it as it seemed to be doing the same to me, but I could not see any eyes or any other facial features. I took my eyes off for a split second as I looked around the living room and my siblings, thinking had one of them slipped out to the patio and I hadn't seen them leave, while at the same time saying to them, to someone standing right outside the window. When I looked back, it was gone. See, there's a lot more that I hope to be able to share with you and through you in order to help others gain a better slash more accurate understanding of all things. That's the end of it. All right, well, James, email us back again. And uh, obviously, like you've heard me say it before, if you actually sought out this channel on YouTube and then did dig in to find the email and emailed us, you probably know what it was, right? And maybe some from, someone from the same area will possibly email us or comment in the comment section below and add to that, maybe, right? One more, I'm going to get going. Experience of Granite Creek, California and answers and questions. Dear Steve, your channel is now part of my daily routine and an excellent resource for many. Thank you for that. And for the landscapes, wisdom and experiences of others that you share. Absolutely top-notch experience. First, you asked today in your broadcast, what brings people to your channel? My answer would be that it is a center for truth tellers and your easygoing and open mind, open attitude attracts many of the same kind. A line from the film, Field of Dreams, strikes me. Build it, and they will, build it and they will come. And that is what you've done. I applaud you and the contributions of the other members of this family that participate in the broadening of our horizons. It is in itself a center, but don't ask me to define that. It's just a knowing. Thanks for the kind words, man. My experience with the unseen occurred when I was 16 years old, when I felt ambitious enough to go hike into Granite Canyon, a well-kept secret to a few in the area just south of Carmel, California. I followed a cow trail over the ridge of the wildflowers in April one year, alone, dropping down into a redwood forest that had a fresh water creek that I had hiked to with others, but never alone before. Rumor was that it was haunted, but my father, father had hiked throughout the Los Padre Forest as a teen himself, though he rarely spoke of his experiences. That would have been back in the 30s for him and the 70s for me. After crossing the ridge and finding myself in a grassy bank alongside a stream, I sat down to eat my lunch, a French baguette and a round of laughing cow cheese, laid out in a checkered tablecloth to add to the ambience. Ambience. No sooner than the movement of my lunch was out and I sat back in the sun, everything around me spoke a silent whisper, not a scream, to leave immediately. Fear doesn't begin to describe it. Yes, Danger was the feeling and imminent danger. If it had been verbal, it would have been, it would have been the words, go now. Odd, because there was nothing about the day to be afraid of, but it felt like I was being watched. Not by one, but by many. And the watchers seemed to be in the trees, up the stream, and almost in the air. Just in every aspect of the experience. At first I laughed it off because I was a girl in my teens, feeling indestructible at being out on my own. But within seconds, it was no longer a joke or a paranoid moment, but an immediate concern. I left within minutes after packing up my lunch, and I never went back. Something was there that did not want me to be there, and it wasn't a human being. It was in the air, a knowing. I can't describe it any better than that. It was shared knowledge between me and something else and not a person. The message was that it was not my space, and I should leave immediately. 
A few years later, my friends and I went hiking in the same region, this time starting from Palo, Colorado, for a demanding hike up the Pine Ridge Trail from the Boy Scout camp at Boucher's Gap. We arrived on the ridge, set up camp, and had a small fire to cook on before going to bed in our sleeping bags out under the stars. The fire was put out appropriately. Around midnight or so, a dense fog took over the ridge, and I awoke with an imminent fear of a forest fire. The fog I saw morphed into a forest fire, though there was no reason for it. No real fire, but an awareness that the entire ridge would be taken over by fire. The feeling was trapped, and remember, this wasn't the current day. This is almost 50 years ago when fires weren't started like they are today. Like so many others have said, and like I felt before in the wild of Granite Canyon, the message was to leave immediately. Excuse me. No one else in our group mentioned it. We hiked out the next day and I never went back. The feeling was much the same as the first experience in Granite Creek, which wasn't far from Pine Ridge as the crow flies. Water, granite, steep cliffs, and dense redwood forests. Not public land, but state slash national forest. In retrospect, I didn't see anything, but the sensation was much more intuitive than physical. I'm not a fearful person. I'm a forest, forester's daughter, as well as a granddaughter of a forester, my dad's father, who worked as a forester for the state back in the early 1900s, always in charge of land in North California, from Shasta to King City and to the West. They were firefighters, fire spotters, as well as land management back in the day. They certainly weren't talkers, and if no one tried to ask about these experiences, it would have been met with a keen eye, a sharp expression, and zero disclosure as to unexplainable things. They might have known, but they never would have told. The beings of the forest are real, even if you can't see them. They are there, and use methods to communicate to people who can receive. We hear them, even if we do not understand what we are hearing and feeling. I'd like to toss out a question to all the people who listen to your broadcast and have been exposed to these experiences and see if they agree or not with a the theory that I have. Perhaps they might contribute additional theories of their own. I'm of the belief that people who have had near-death experiences in their lives are more receptive to the psychic energy of these beings. An interesting study for those who have seen them or experienced them would be to ask, have you had a near-death experience? Somehow I have an inkling that if one has had a near-death, they have an enhanced radar. I could explain that more in depth and would be glad to, but I know you have a new property to tend to and a lovely wife waiting cute outfits for the animals, by the way, and other people who are equally as glad as I am for all that you do. If you read this on your broadcast, let me just say, this channel and this experience is one of the finer things in life. And I can speak for all of us who say to you how thankful we are for doing what you do. All the best of all things, wonderful coming your way. Sorry, all the best of all things wonderful coming your way, and the same to all others that listen to your broadcast, and a very Merry Christmas to everyone. Thank you, Rhonda. All right, thank you for that email. And those kind words that you shared for me and everybody here. Appreciate it. Now, if any of you want to tap into those questions, it's going to be best for you to, to uh, comment in the comment section below this video, all right? And I'm sure our... Uh, messenger will be listening okay see anything run across the power line cut there are a few birds over there now so it's not dead quiet anymore you just hear some of the, some of the tires on the pavement which is about a mile that way coming up from the back valley bottom but anyway I'm gonna go. I gotta head out. And uh, what do I got? I got probably, I don't know, I'll bet you I have around uh, 150 pounds of salt in my truck that I purchased at a feed store. I think I've got uh, 15 trail cameras. And I am going to go and get lost way out there in all that land you can see. All out there, as far as you can see. I'm gonna go dive into the middle of it. I'm gonna go everywhere. I'm going to find some secluded places to dump some salt in a pile. And I'm going to leave two cameras on each pile. And they're going to be separated by miles. One camera will be set on video. I think I'm probably going to do 
eight second videos and have it triggered for every five minutes. Because the shitty thing about this time of year is when, when you're putting these cameras out, the ground's flat, everything's dead, and you gotta guess if you're in a spot where they grow up and then hit the wind and kill your camera in no time at all. I want these cameras to last for months. So I'm gonna take my time, do it properly. And then uh, the next time I will come back up here will probably be September 1st-ish for elk. And then uh, I'll be taking a couple of uh, first time hunters with me and I'm gonna hopefully get them a great big bull elk and we'll get it on video and call them in and it'll be really good. And then uh, after that, I'll go home and then I will come back up to this country again in late November and see if I can't chase down one of those great big whitetails. And as well, bring a few friends up, a couple are disabled, and help them get a big bison with a friend of mine who's got a huge bison ranch up there. I bring home that delicious frickin' meat. So there we go. I think it's like 7 o'clock at night. Um, I'm in the north, getting closer and closer to the land of the midnight sun, this far up north, and the days are very much longer. So if I throw up the old four finger, the old four finger guesstimate, one, two, three. So it's got three more hours until the sun hits the top of the mountains. And I think it's, let's see what time it is. The days get longer the farther you go north. So it's 6.30 right now, 9.30. So what, it's going to be seeing light until around 10 o'clock at night. Crazy, eh? Here we go. Back later.